Greetings one and all, Chris Courtney here, New Pragmatics, time for the feedback loop. We have a quad of uh, students coming through today, a, um, let's see, a medley, I consider a trio, maybe this is more of a medley, this is more of a medley, a trio is like three, um, but but this medley of students coming through, we've got uh, Ricardo's in, we've got Bryn, Maddie, and I want to say it's Abby, um, that have all submitted work through today, so and everybody's in like really different different things, so that's all always exciting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and come over here and share my screen so we can get this underway. I'm going to start off with Ricardo. Ricardo's up on screen, so why don't we just start there? Ricardo um, is working through his active weekend, so he's like right in that first UX project where he's he's been doing some research and he's trying to distill down. Um, this into a presentation and a set of recommendations for for a client now there is a recorded portion to this that i'm ricardo if you're watching this after after this is over i'm going to go watch the recording and that'll give me a better sense of of how you're presenting the information right now when i look at your swat and for anybody who's not familiar this is strength opportunity uh, strength weakness opportunity and threat um it's not, it's not labeled. And, and again, I'm hoping that's how, <laughs> I'm hoping that's what I'm finding here is SWAT, but establish a uh, trusting relationship with running, uh, r running tournaments at an industry level. That's the strength of active weekends. Uh, no outside activity, outside physical activity. Um, um, no events outside of physical activity. Uh, virtual watching parties. Uh, so that's the weakness of act active weekends. Uh, engaging uh, opportunity is to engage an audience that does not feel comfortable going out right now through well analyzed guidelines, virtual events, and some form of tracking. Okay. And then COVID restrictions getting worse if people don't actually, and if people don't actually follow the guidelines. So strength, they have this established uh, base of customers. Weakness, Aside from physical activity, they don't have anything. Uh, opportunity, growing that audience in places that they currently aren't, that they currently are not, and and threat. You know, if COVID gets worse, which it is, this is going to be a problem. So this is a very timely project. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of organizations bringing in outside consultants trying to figure out what the hell to do. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I wrote this project. I feel I feel like this project. Is going to be with us for a while, okay? Um, now you've all you've also broke down some uh, some uh, the known unknowns and the you know so you've got your unknown knowns, um, incre uh, income, revenue, site app, and sports engagement, um, um, COVID outbreaks, and there are some misspellings here, but this is not a, this is not a dot going out to uh, a, a um, client, so I'm not I'm not worried about it. I'm not getting caught up in that. Um, if, if it was something I was going to show a client, I definitely want to, want to clean that up. Um, and and what's interesting here is an unknown known is something that I'm ignoring. I, I'm I'm ignoring the fact that it's there. Okay, this is that's bias. So I'm not really sure because we have we have I haven't. This is the first time I've seen you put this together. I'm not really sure if that unknown knowns is is accurate. But but let's just put that in the back pocket for now. No knowns. People want to play sports. There are a lot of athletes uh, that are uncomfortable playing. A lot of offices have gone remote. Yeah, that's that's the known knowns. Known unknowns. So what sport? What sport athletes are most interested in? How impactful uh, guidelines are at keeping people safe? So so what sports are these athletes willing to play? Basically. And are those guidelines going to work? Those are those are the known known unknowns. We don't know the answer to those questions in this environment. And the unknown unknowns is how well uh, people will follow the guidelines, the course of COVID restrictions. Um, school coaches uh, will need these guidelines and ways of social distancing and engagement. And and I would I would has. I would hesitate to say that those are known unknowns. Unknown unknowns are things that you literally don't know to even ask right now. Okay? So the unknown unknowns are this 
wide reaching, far expansive group of information that you wish you could access, but it's just not accessible. You, you don't even know to ask those questions yet. So if you know to ask the question, it's a known unknown, not a unknown unknown. The unknown unknowns will always be an empty column because you don't know to ask the question yet it, by default. Um, so it's nice to see that you, you put together a SWAT. Again, I'm not really sure about these unknown knowns, but we'll kind of look at that. Um, I want to come over here to the presentation. Again, haven't worked with Ricardo um, as, uh, on visual design yet, so I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting zero... Uh, zero focus on the visual design. I'm really focusing on a fine point. Like you, you know, you could have put a one sheet together. You could have put a presentation together. You chose presentation, which is fine. But I'm really putting a fine point on: Are you making a recommendation that somebody can act on? Okay. Are you are you leading off the top? So you got your cover street and initial, uh, the initial recommendation. My initial recommendation is. For upcoming season, these sports are the most popular in your area. Softball, soccer, flag football, bas basketball. First of all, some of those are summer sports. We're heading into winter. Um, that's going to look out of step. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a, hey, here's what we know people like. So I don't think that should leave. Um, initial recommendations, specific guidelines for each sport and guidelines for high, for coaches and referees. High risk, me contact medium risk, lower risk. Um, okay, so let's let's not focus on the high risk. Like these, the these are like this me high high risk, medium risk, and low risk. Those are slides all to themselves. Um, Right now, I think they're getting in the way of like contact. You know, initial recommendation: contact contactless waivers are a must. That's a great recommendation. It's I'm missing it because I'm focusing on this black text here that's like medium risk. I don't know why I'm looking at that. Uh, specific guidelines for each sport and guidelines for uh, initial recommendations. Uh, you need specific guidelines for each sport. Period. Um, it's it's not as strong as contactless waivers are a must um, as far as a recommendation goes um, but I, I get it um, softball baseball if at least six feet apart in dugout areas or players seated six feet apart this is where you got to go back to you know what sports are we playing what, what sports are we what sports are we doing because this is like a right now thing. Our client is wondering about the near future. They're worrying about, wondering about basketball and can they have indoor volleyball tournaments and things like that. I would, I do want to circle back around to the questions that you asked in the stakeholder interview to see were they talking about baseball? I don't know that they were. I, I you know, we need to go look at that. And and so much of this is so much of this goes back to utilizing the information that you've gathered to look at what the client is wanting to do. The client is concerned about the future, not the season that just passed. Uh, types of play. Now this goes back to specific guidelines for each sport. So I'm not really sure why we're circling back here. Uh, observation. People wear masks. People want to stay active. Not a lot of social distancing. Competitive research all have uh, <coughs> sorry about that all have sports specific guidelines d digital waivers um, and virtual events now this is something that uh, you that's going out to a client so you definitely want to nail down all misspellings okay uh, navigating sports during COVID-19 you know it's okay. I I think it lacks. I think it lacks some clear guidance. You know, you've got you you've got you, you your initial recommendation is one two three four five six seven pages. So which where is it? Where is that initial recommendation? 
because I get seven. I get seven pages of it before I get to something that isn't the initial recommendation. Focus. We gotta focus. Okay. When you're when you're talking with a client, you gotta you gotta you know. Do you have thirty seconds? Do you have two minutes? You don't have thirty minutes. All right. You gotta focus. I'm really interested in seeing seeing what you do in front of this because you know I've said this a, a number of times. Ricardo, I know you're relatively new here, but presentations are part part print design. So it's like literally it's static. It's part motion design because obviously it changes. And it's part theater. It's part theater. You're in front of it. So it's you know it's got all of these different principles of of communication that kind of merge together in one in one format. Um, I think it's a really important thing to to master. Um, and as oddly enough, uh, there was a book that, not a book but more of a white paper that just came out today called "Presenting Your Design Work." Or um, presenting design work, I think, is the actual title. It's from the uh, book apart folks, the people that have um, have these uh, these books. You recognize the the book apart design. Um, anyway, the the point here is uh, there's a lot of focus on this space, and you want to get to a point where you're really mastering it. And that's why. We cover this a number of times in the program. You present your work a number of times because it matters. It definitely matters. And when when you get into an interview, what you'll find is that nobody's looking at your portfolio in the interview. They're looking at you presenting your work. And that being said, you need to get really good at this. All right? So you're early. This is like your first shot at it. We'll work on it. Okay? Um, so that's Ricardo. Let's come over here to, to Maddie. Maddie has her um, portfolio. Maddie's working on her portfolio. And I challenged Maddie to go through. And she's kind of doing this thing where she's using Squarespace as a, as a tool to build the initial version of the portfolio. So she's got something up and running. Um, but she's she's then going to come back and, and work through front end and we're going to like build it for real with more control and Maddie, will, Maddie can tell you all too well that in going through and looking at um, in going through and working with Squarespace it's like you definitely realize where the tools do not they do not give you as much refinement as much opportunity at refinement as you would like um, so we're going to go in here. She looks like she's got a key, um, annotations key, um, global styles, typography, an asset. All right. So asset composition cropped too closely at top and bottom, rounded corners, like the case study hero image. Um, that would be accurate. So, so here, Maddie, I would, I would, I would consider doing one of two things. Um, I would either come in and crop it tighter basic basically chopping off at least one portion of it and you know if you did this I might actually I might actually you know move the two a little further up and down uh, so that you know so that you you had a little more space to the top of this and to the bottom of that, um, or you know go the other route. You know and expand it a bit, and I say a bit because you don't want it to get too big. Obviously, selected works and growing Gerber would need to move, um, but I would either I would either tighten it up or or loosen. I would either tighten it up or go looser. Um, it's still better than where you were previously, but it's just a little tight. So I I, I agree with that. I would either go further or loosen. 
Uh, let's see your button style. Crop too closely at top and bottom. Oh, um, I think your type got copied. So anyway, let's look at this button style. Um, I like the icon. Uh, it's it's outlined. I'm guessing that it's you know you're doing this to indicate that you you need a password to access that. Um, but I don't know what the questions are there because it looks like it just was copy paste. Um, cramped feels cramped. Small typographical alignment. Dislike that it's top aligned. Um, well. You know, here's the question I've got about these. Um, do you need, you know, I, I know why, I know why you're doing the, the color swatch here. And it's because this is using the color swatch. But do you need it? Could you just, could you just use this interface and just make a, just make it the interface? Because it's not like you've got it's not like you have a design that has like a lot of white in it like yes this is this this mega drop down here uh, definitely this mega menu ha definitely has a has a lot of white but you've got a shadow on it I mean it, I think you can make it a little larger and actually fill the space instead of doing a swatch uh, does it make the swatch bad no um, I, I still know what it is. It's, you know, uh, and, and the other question I have is, am I really going to see that much more of it if I get rid of that color swatch? And the answer is probably not. I'm probably not going to, it's not going to blow it up enough for me to get a, a much better look at it. So that's something that I would keep in mind um, is that, yeah, it might look a little bigger. It might feel a little less cr cramped, quote cramped, but it's not gonna. It's not really gonna change the visual. As far as the alignment, this is totally a taste thing. Um, do you have any? No, I'm kidding. That's so rude. Uh, <laughs> I know you're laughing, so that's fine. Um, I can see this bottom aligned, like you know, where the you know the label here, the uh, link is a, like a line with the bottom. I could see this uh, centered, like where it's centered on the depth of the box. You can see a top aligned. It really just comes down to you. Um, I, what I wouldn't want to do is I wouldn't want to like center the text and then center it, or I wouldn't want to necessarily uh, right align the text. Like there's some just stuff that I wouldn't do. Um, but overall, I think, it, I, I, I think if you decide you want to do something different there, that's fine stylistically like the typography is where I would want it to be and I would just leave it let it let it go at that point um, still want to come back to this this area because it's like it looks great at full screen and then when it goes down it starts moving around and and without getting into that shape and how Squarespace is using it I I'm not really certain what it's doing and I just want to like check something real quick because it, it, I just had a freak out moment is my, yes, my audio is working, okay. I don't know if you remember last week, the audio went out, and I did eventually get it fixed, but then people were watching the video going, oh, Chris recorded the whole thing without audio. It's like, no, I, t I plugged the audio back in, but unfortunately, unfortunately, people thought the video was uh, was empty because that, that segment was empty, so anyway, I digress. All right, let's look, look here. Um, Full bleed yellow background. Eh, I could. I mean, I pro. I probably would, but that's me. Um, I'm. I'm looking at the rest of it. Like, do you use the yellow anywhere else? No. I mean, I. I. I don't see it. I don't see a reason for the presentation with this. I would probably go yellow all the way up. Like I, I would just, I would just do it as a full field. Um, in in doing so, you get rid of, you know, it's this is the only place where that color is utilized. Um, so I, I would probably make that, I'd, I'd make that adjustment. Um, 
push column over to match those below. Um, push column over to match those below. I I don't know that you have to. It, it, like this is the only area where that, that, that typographic structure is being used. And my, my question is always about like, what's my, what's my consistency between in here you've got it you've got it flipped from this and here you've got it all the way across uh, I need space to the right go with this go with this format across projects uh, okay so if that's if that's what you want to do I think that's fine but I would just make sure to pull this into that mold and this is you know for, for those those of you that haven't been part of the conversations that Maddie and I have been having one of the reasons why she's doing this is when you're working in Squarespace, which is what she's doing, it's incredibly hard to see what the design is from page to page to page and how you are implementing it. Um, it's very easy to do slightly different versions of the same design or use heading two when you should have used heading one. And without having the ability to look at these things side by side, it it's nearly impossible to really see see where the inconsistencies are in the work you know um so so that's that's where i'm at with it the other thing i would mention is now that now that we're looking at speaking of inconsistencies side by side we've got the blue going all the way up to the top and it stops right here i you know you've got the yellow here and you've got the blue um i am kind of curious do you want would you want to bring that yellow in on the others? Um, would you, should you be going with the blue instead all the way? It, sh should it stop here at the top? These are some questions that I would encourage you to investigate. I don't necessarily know that there's a right answer, but this is one of those things where we're talking about consistency, okay? And, you know, I've, I've worked with students before that want to have every case study be different. I would prefer that, that they all be good. And if you can land on a good design, you should you should go with that rather than rolling the dice every time and potentially wrecking the car because you came up with one that, that kind of sucked. Happens. Um, th this, this work doesn't suck. It's, it's fine, um, for the record. So more spacing above the heading. Uh, part one, eh, I could see that, yeah, because all of, but all of these, all of these headings do not have a big photo of an avocado above them, so I think that may be one of the, one of the issues that's playing a role there. Rounded PNGs with text headings, more stylized there, uh, I mean, I guess you could. Text headings, is that like a label over these? Is that what you're thinking, or are you th think, think, thinking about a heading there find a way to summarize and stack competitors n nicely yeah you know, so so when you were talking about stacking competitors uh, this is where logos sometimes come in because it's difficult to show like the competitors like interfaces without because they're all gonna be small and you're, you're already trying to get people to focus on your work this is where I'm, I'm, you know, if you if you do want to show their their interface, that's fine. But I wouldn't try to show all of them, and then I would probably just bring in like, you know, here's the logos of the competitors that, you know, so so you have a you have a, a touch point, and then you could also link out to those competitors from their logo. And so if somebody did want to um, go look at that more in depth, they could like just there to stick like away. Uh, record round at PNGs with text headings. Uh, full bleed or full width inset. Uh, break these out to multiple image. Uh, treat these all the same. So, with this, um, I think you could go. You could go full full bleed. Um, you know, that's some something that at this point you could definitely like come all the way across and. You know, I, I think that you crop it at that point. I don't think that you try to do it all the way down. I think basically the full bleed is hitting everything through here 
and then you give them a link to go look at it more in depth. And this is kind of what we were talking about last week. Um, you, know, you, you could also do something similar and just and just crop it here. But but I think if you were going to do that, you want to like take that last long column out. Uh, just to give people a better sense and basically that size would be stretched up instead of instead of just trying to you know take the same design and just like crop it short um, but you know you, you have some options there that I think would be would be beneficial to this design um, none more so than like editing this as we talked about last week but I know that, I know that you know overhauling something like this takes a minute so but I think I think it definitely would help. The bottom of this design right now is just kind of like just floating around because of this one chart. So I would redraw the chart. I'm not changing. I'm not. I'm not saying change the chart. The chart needs to do the same thing it did before. Just needs to be redrawn. Um, so yeah. Um, and then here's your drawings and your about page. I think your about page is very. It feels very classy. Um, I like the fact that we see you, but we also see like some of your, um, some some of the thing. You know, we get a sense of like, it's almost like nuggets from inside your head. I'm not sure if that's what the intention was, but it, it's kind of how it feels. Um, yeah, and then that I think that's the original. Okay, so I think we've you know we've effectively drilled down on this. Please let me know if you have further questions. But otherwise, um, by the way, Funko Land, just a reminder, doing this tomorrow. Hope to see you there. Um, that's for everybody, not just Maddie. But I'd love to see Maddie there, too. Um, so that's Ricardo. That's Maddie. Let's jump into Bryn. Okay. So, Bryn, you've got a couple of... Bryn's, Bryn's in this weird spot. And, and I, I absolutely love this, actually. This is like one of my favorite improvements over the way I've taught UX UI before and it's something I wish that I would have had when Luigi and Eve were going through the first versions of UX back last year this time um, I didn't have the UI course like created so when Luigi and Eve would hit hit the lull that Bren's going through which the lull is always you send out the survey and you're trying to build your research cohort and you don't quite get enough people you have to send it out in a slightly different place. You're trying to trying to generate the replies necessary, and it takes a while. It like this. It it's not something that you know. Some people can get, can get it done in like a day. Other people it takes like a week. Um, but what do you do in the meantime? I really believe that that's one of it's one of the places where most boot camps just like either they skip building research cohorts and that you don't do real user interviews or you take the time to do this. Um, so so while while we're, while Bren's been doing that, she's going through UI now. And one of the things about UI is that all the exercises are um, bespoke. Like they're not connected together necessarily, um, which means you can dive in and dive out. This particular exercise that Bren's working through, and Bren, I know you have exercise one, which is why UI, and I'll get into I'll get into that offline. Um, I wanted to take a look at your sketches, um, mainly because the important thing to realize, you should and you should be getting this from user flows, as you will see with Abby in just a moment. But when you're going through UI, you should immediately get a sense that. Design is something that happens over a series of steps, okay? Uh, there is no single screen that makes an interface work. It's a series of screens or a series of steps that create a process that gets something done. And, and this is, you know, part of the reason why I have you, you know, sketch the checkout flow is I want you to immediately realize that like, okay, I go to the homepage, then I go to the search search results, and then I got the product description, and then I add something to cart, and you know the problem there is there's there's more to the there's more to this checkout flow. Okay, now I'm not looking for you to share with me your credit card details and whatnot, but when you add something to, to the cart, 
you still have to pick up pick out sh shipping you still have to pick out credit card you still have to determine um you have to determine that you typically get a a view results like or a view summary and then you actually do the thing so the checkout flow i think is was one of those things that's so important that i would encourage you to like take another sheet of your notepad and take 10 minutes and sketch the whole thing out because this checkout flow is some, is very close to what you may utilize in a client app, in a e-commerce project, in a freelance project. Like th this basic flow you'll utilize over and over and over again. And I just wanna make sure that rather than having to constantly go back and go, what does Amazon do? You just, you, you know what Amazon does because you've, you've taken the time to, to, to map it out. So that's fine. Here we've got the, the Figma account screen and it almost feels like that, um, it, it's what's funny here is Figma's account screen is very simple, okay? Um, to the point that even though this is a desktop approach, you could, you could, see, you could see how this might be uh, used on mobile. You know, it's like, here's the home screen, I, I click on create an account and then you know there's this onboarding flow and then i name a project and off we're off and running so it's very simple franken oak women's accessories uh so here's the promo pop-up like so, so there's some you go to the home page there's some sort of pop-up then you're on the home screen then you're on the the nav um nav expand it and then you're in the accessory section. The important thing here is that, you know, there's always this idea that it, it should only take X number of steps to get to a desired location. Um, but that's only possible here because we put a lot more information in front of people in that navigation, that, that mega menu, much like what, what Maddie did with Burt's Bees, and you saw when we were kind of reviewing her portfolio, that was one of the things that she was showing there. Um, that mega menu is so crucial to getting people where they want to go and making them click multiple times through there is not a great idea. But at the same time, we, we've always been told, don't overload the screen with stuff. Well, it's okay if it's the right stuff. But it's got to be the right stuff. And that's where, you know, when you click accessories and you get all the accessory options, that's the right stuff. If you click that mega menu and it was just a bunch of different crap, then that would be the wrong stuff. Um, ESPN also does a really good job of this. Um, they've got a gigantic mega menu. If you hit, um, if you hit soccer, for instance, it will give you, you know, all uh, the various leagues, the big teams, um, and it's a lot of it's a lot of information to take in, but I can't tell you how much harder the site would be to navigate if they didn't put so much stuff in that mega menu. Same thing here for Frank and Oak. And here's op Open Table. So reservation scheduling, home screen, restaurant options, restaurant details. Yeah, there's. So, so like this is the second time Amazon was the first friend. This is the second where you've you've gotten through the walk up, and maybe there's more here, and I'm just not I'm just not seeing it. Let's let's come, let's double click here. No, I, like like with Open Table reservation, you've got the pick a time, right? Then you've got the confirmation, um, and, and people will ask like do you want me to go ahead and confirm? And it's like, yeah, sure, cancel it. Like, and it's also valuable to see what the cancellation is. Um, like, what, is that, what does that flow look like? This is all about investigating and studying the patterns that exist right now online, right now in e-commerce, right now, it, it, some of the, most of this is frankly e-commerce. Uh, Figma wasn't though, Figma was just like onboarding. Um, knowing these flows, knowing how, how they, they work pays dividends because it, it tell it, it gives you a base to begin building your projects from. And you can't, you know, a lot of people say, well, isn't, 
Isn't that just, just copying? Well, keep in mind, one of the secrets about somebody saying that this design is good and it's familiar and it feels natural and intuitive is because they've seen something like it before. If you come up with something that's just out of left field, it could be, it could be well designed and completely reject it because it is so different from everything else that's preceded it that people go, oh, this, this feels weird. And, and they don't accept it. It doesn't mean that it's not good. It could be substantially better. But substantially better typically makes it through if it still has hallmarks of an existing design. So I really believe that design typically is more evolutionary than revolutionary. And if it's going to be revolutionary, it, it's got to it's got to be accompanied with something else. like like when the iPhone came out, you know, the, like that that was a whole ecosystem that arrived at once. That was a revolutionary moment. The same thing can be said for VR. You know, there were no evolutionary steps that got to those first VR interfaces, but VR itself happened, and th there had to be an interface to go with it. So. I think there's a lot there to take in, but I, I wouldn't. I would encourage you to to finish the flows. Um, I, I I appreciate the 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 work that went in uh, to getting these done, but we want to we want to push just slightly further. Um, Abby, we're gonna wrap up here with Abby, and she she's we got some gold diamonds here. The gold diamonds indicate um, pro, uh, processes that have been refined further. So um, let's see here, create individual lessons. So this is, I'm, I'm a teacher logging in system. I'm gonna view, I'm on the homepage. I'm gonna select the create assignment button. Um, I get a form pop-up for creating new, new assignment. So boop. Um, I can assign the class, assignment, assign, assign assignment to a class, which is optional. Ass add due date, which is optional. So you're kind of getting it now. Now I'm getting this granular feel of like I can I can literally see like the little asterisks next to uh, fields that are optional, and we'll get more into that in interface design. But this shows you the granularity that you can go to in your flows, and and you know Abby, this is like the third time through on some of your flows, but that's that's what happens when you when you've gotten through and you've, you've discussed it to this point. So um, I do think that like something that might be might something that feels like it's out of order is like assign assignment to a class. I wouldn't do that until I've um, a, until after I've titled it after I've inserted the main text. Um, I believe that I will um, add additional assets. And then I might do these actions. Like these actions I believe could be somewhere down here. Um, you know, add additional assets. Um, you know, I can do these. And then you're going select save and the assignment will save to a specific, uh, to assignments or a specific class. So now I'm seeing that there's an assignments, there's an assignments area and then there's specific, there's specific, you know, or it goes to a specific class. Um, that could only happen after I assigned it to a class. Um, so, so like, I still feel like, uh, I feel like this is, this is definitely giving me more of an idea of what the interface is going to expect. These are form fields that should be down here though. Okay. At least after I've put them, the initial information in for the assignment. Um, so slight tweak there, but all, all the right parts just, you know, previously it was the right parts. Well, some of the right parts and some of the right order. Now we have all the right parts, but a slightly, slightly different order. Um, but really all that stuff could be in, you know, in that pop-up and it's just like where in the pop-up do are the fields. So turn into assignment for grading, save assignments for archive. Um, so I'm a student, I go to my homepage, I select turn in assignment button, assignment form will pop up. 
select class it is for, create title. Um, it's interest. Okay, so this flow is interesting. This flow is interesting because if so, this sounds like I'm turning in an assignment almost in a way that I'm turning in a, an assignment almost in the way that a teacher creates an assignment. Like I get a form that pops up. I select turn in assignment button. So like I'm on the homepage, I'm like, turn in assignment. Wouldn't assignment, wouldn't an assignment already have to be coupled with something that like a lesson that the teachers already, already produced? Um, I, like how do I, how do I couple this assignment to a particular, uh, how do I couple what they're turning in to the assignment that the teacher has has created? It seems like, especially if I've got a due date, when I'm on the when I'm a student, I'm on the homepage. I have do do next, or it's it's due today, due this week, and like I see the I sh it feels like I should see those assignments that are coming over from the teacher, and instead of selecting turn in assignment. I should select one of those things that are due, and then I get the assignment form. But it's it's already assigned to a, you know I, I don't have to select what class it's for. I, it that all that information is coming over with it because the teacher has said the teacher's already said uh, this is geometry, and it's due on I mean, what's today the twentieth. Okay, so. I'm a student and I go to my homepage and it says due today because it's due October 20th and I click it and what class is it for? Well, it's already for geometry. I know, I know that because I'm in this class and it's showing, this is showing up on my screen because I'm already in the class. I create the title. I don't have to create a title. Um, I can add assets. The title is already, the title was created by the teacher. Okay. Um, I can add assets, like here's the stuff that I needed to, here's the stuff that I did for this assignment. Save options. Save and turn into teacher. Just save the student assignment folder. So, so I could, I, I see, I see two options here. I see save, like I'm not ready to turn it in or submit or turn it. I mean, whatever language you want to use there. Um, save it, doesn't turn it in save and submit turns in or save save and turn in ships it to the teacher so um because there will be there will be assignments that are kind of ongoing you do a little work on it and you come back to it so i get that but you know this down here works largely create title don't need it select what class it's for don't need it assignment form will pop up yes um i shouldn't have to select the assignment to turn in select from assignments due um yeah so i mean i think that one needs that one needs some work but most of it is there it's just it, and again this is like when you're going through the flow you have to you have to think about okay these are these are two sides of the same coin right teachers created the assignment she's already input a lot of information the student shouldn't have to input like a title like it's already there, okay? If the student wants to add a comment, I could totally see a, you know, it, but you've got text in form field text. I mean, that could be that, that could be any number of things. It could be information about the assignment. It could be a comment. Like there's, is there any text attached to this? Okay, um, task, view assignment for grading log grade, okay. So log into the system, view homepage, um, we'll wait. Okay, so the, the two options. So I'm kind of interested to see what the difference is here. Um, turned in assignments button, select classes, view list of classes, scroll to needed class, view list of assignments, turned in most recent, filter by options, class, student, um, scroll to needed assignment, select assignment, view assignment. 
Um. So like, like this feels like it's just everything that's been turned in. Um. Here's all my classes. I can I can say just show me one particular class, and then I can scroll through them. Yeah, I mean th that largely works. Um. Okay, so here we have another option. Login it. Here's my homepage. I can go to classes. I can view my classes. I can scroll to a, to a class. I can select the class. I can locate assignments for that specific class. So you're you're getting there now. View list of assignments turned in most recent. Filter by student name. Scroll to select assignment. View assignment. So what we're getting here now is this understanding that there's more than one way to get to the same area in a in a platform okay you've got on your dashboard a here's the assignments that have come in that's great i can i can access that there or if i'm in you know what's important is if i'm doing some work in my class and i'm already in the class i shouldn't have to go back out to the dashboard to go back in to go into grade assignments I should be able to grade those assignments in the class you know it, it could be a preference thing but um, there are there what you're illustrating here is a is a good dynamic this this works for me overall you know and, and you're in in this you're saying I have I have something on the dashboard for assignments I also have something on the dashboard for my classes all right um, as a teacher, I'm beginning to get a sense of what is there. What can I do? Um, so this this is good. Um, view grades. So view grades. I'm going to update this one. Okay, so I'm going to log in the system. I'm a student. I'm going to go to the homepage. I'm going to go to grades button. Uh, I'm going to view classes with overall grades next to it. Select a specific class, view all graded assignments, select assignment for grade overview and ask and, and any feedback. Um, okay, so I get that. So I'm a student, like I'm not gonna see the teacher's view of the dashboard or of my dashboard, but I'm gonna get my version of it. And I'm on the homepage, I can select grades. What else would be here? Like the do, like we just talked about it, do next, you know, or uh, you know some sort of running list uh would there you know here th now we're beginning to enter into a, a good moment to th think about like what else is in this environment like is it just grades and assignments are there any notifications is there you know it, do i see like a list of my classes um you know th there's a lot of stuff here um do I see, is there like chatter amongst my, my classmates? I don't know. Um, but, it, but it's definitely, it's definitely interesting. Um, we've got, you've gone a couple now where I think that they are really close to being accurate flows. Only that, only that one appear for the student submitting their work felt really out of place. Um, so text or task access shareable materials from other classes okay so I'm the teacher I go to my homepage there's a resources button um, I select the subject so I want geometry here's a full list of assignments for geometry I can filter by class type of class or all classes so type of class would be like I'm looking for eighth grade geometry or I'm looking for advanced geometry like you know any number of things all uh, type of class or all classes um, that really wouldn't be a filter, um, but whatever. Um, select assignment needed. Uh, one thing that you could filter by, though, it would be um, be um, attachments. Like I, w I only want pro I only want ass uh, assignments that have exercise or that have PDFs, or I only want exercise exer assignments that have uh, video tutorials with them. So you could probably filter by attachment type that would be one thing that you might add there but that's um so select assignment uh view assignment and assets saving options i could save as uh choose a class to assign it to or i could archive it watch out for the misspellings 
Um, I could archive it for archive save for future use. I could save to class assignments. So this is I found something. I don't know where to put it yet. I have an archive. Like my th this is this is favorites. Okay. This is heart check mark thumbs up whatever. You you've just described favorites. Okay. Um, choose class to add assignment to, and then you s save it to a specific thing. You could duplicate it. Okay. So duplicate it says I want to. This concept is forking. Okay. So you're you're describing a couple of patterns here, which is exciting because I, I feel like these are naturally occurring at the at this moment. So du you're duplicating there. Edit. You're editing and adding those adjustments. So. Um, and then you're, this is interesting. So you've added your adjustment. Do you reshare that to the community? You could, you could say, hey, uh, this is a fork of somebody else's assignment. I added some video assets and I'm resharing it back. Um, uh, th this is also, uh, would, in terms of code, to be referred to as a pull request. Um, but, uh, Choose to add assignment, choose class to add assignment, save the class assignments, uh, or archive for save for future use. That one's really good. That one was really good. I like that one. I like that one a lot. I think there's a couple of ways that we might be able to modify it, but overall, I thought that was that that might have been one of your strongest flows. Um, okay, sign up for tutoring extra help. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm a student. I select the tutoring button. So again, now we're getting a sense of, you know, what do, what's on this interface? Well, apparently there's a tutoring button. Um, so I, I can view a list of classes. I can select a class. I want to I want to sign up for a group study session. I want individual tutoring. I'm gonna view a list of teachers available. So I'm guessing if, if I'm in group study, this is a, a list of group study. If I say individual tutoring, this is a group of individuals. So this might be this might be slightly divergent, like same sort of thing, same calendar pop up, view additional available dates, select the date, view list of times available, select the time, view tutoring request overview, submit request. So uh, down here, it's a little fuzzy. It's like, um, should I be able to view list of available times if there's only one time available it's like if i select like and this is where conditional logic comes in like i should show available times if more than one time is available otherwise when i view the date and it says november 12th at 11 a.m it's just november 12th at 11 a.m there is no now select time and it's like one time that's that's a bit of logic that can be written into the system too show these if applicable i need times more than one to produce these views um but they, the overall this is this is again pretty pretty strong i don't know if that's as strong as i don't know if that's as strong as as this one where you're viewing shared assets i'm really excited about that one the but you know up here uh with the the, the student I would overhaul, I want to overhaul that one. Uh, student making making a submission. I think that requires an overhaul. Um, but otherwise, I think the rest of these are good. Make make the student overhaul and then um, and then let's let's chug forward because I think that this has been a really good gro I mean, gosh, I mean, you've gone really deep on this. I, I really feel really feel good about the flows. I mean, this is an initial exercise. You, you're beginning to, you're beginning to take all the research that you've performed to date and and make an interface out of it uh, just from your user research. Um, you're making tools that would be beneficial. You're kind of coupling these two. It's like a two-sided economy. It's a student and it's a teacher. We haven't even talked about the parent yet that wants to check in, um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of good progress here. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the Feedback Loop. Um, Bren and uh, Ricardo, I owe you a little more because you had um, some written work or some recorded work that I need to take a look at. 
But um, Maddie, Abby, Ricardo, Bren, thank you so much for submitting your work for today's feedback loop. It's um, it's always good to see a lot of students beginning to uh, wake back up from the weekend. Um, and um, I hope to see the rest of you kick into gear for tomorrow. But without further ado, I'm Chris Courtney. I'll see some of you later. And for the rest of you, see you tomorrow. Take care.